Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 103. The most important thing I ever learned was you, not them. And I know that sounds really drastic, and I know that sounds really scary. You know, as Oliver DeMille says, it's pulling the pendulum over to one side because the pendulum stuck to the other side. We're focused, so focused on them, we forget about us. And if we get our own education, that's when our children will really benefit from what we can give them. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Anelity Milne. Anelity is the mother of six and counting, the grandmother of eight and counting, and a devoted wife to the perfect partner. She holds a BA in statesmanship at the George Wythe University, a cutting-edge liberal arts college where she is a current master's student in the education department. She is currently working on her master's thesis called The Mentoring Approach. She loves the organic process of teaching and learning without compulsion and force where students are free to discover their own genius and to contribute to the world in their unique way. She is an advocate of teachers as mentors and has given the opportunity to train fellow teachers this revolutionary approach at the two companies she works for, for Lemmy Leadership Education Mentoring Institute and Life Changing Services, where she holds the position of Mentoring Training Director. Welcome, Anelity. Here is the rest of our conversation with Anelity Milne and the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute. Yeah, I know you've tried to <laughs> launch into uh, how your Lemmy schools started, you know, your philosophy and your uh, curriculum with that. Do you want to kind of move into that, what, what that looked like and how you developed that? Yeah, so after I uh, started doing thematic units in my own little community, I met Tiffany and introduced thematic units to her. And she had a great liberal arts education because she was mentored, personally mentored by Oliver DeMille, who also I believe has a great liberal arts education. And what was interesting is I brought that whole thematic unit, a lot of that influence that I had from John Taylor Gatto. And then the liberal arts and thematic units kind of happened because that was the direction that Tiffany was coming from was the liberal arts. And now I'm going to say, while her education as in the liberal arts is not disconnected because they don't liberal arts, they don't disconnect their learning, they weren't necessarily the, the subjects weren't all joined together necessarily. You know, they still, you still, when you're studying philosophy, you study philosophy, you don't necessarily study history with your philosophy, right? Yeah. But the way that you deliver a liberal arts education is so connected anyway, that it's kind of a natural process for it to happen. But so we decided to do it on purpose at a younger age, because typically that liberal arts education would come, you know, if if you studied the the founders, they were getting that real good liberal arts education by the time they were 15, 16 years old. And they would call that kind of that scholar phase kind of area. Well, Um, sometimes I think our traditional public school tries to, they try to keep kids bored long enough that they totally lose interest in getting that liberal arts education. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't think they offer a liberal arts education. Yeah, exactly. Sure. The way we do subject learning, it's not a possibility to do liberal arts education. Let me give you my definition of liberal arts, though, because that's going to be important. Some people would say, oh, isn't that classical education? And I would say, yes, you can say that is. But in my mind, there's a lot of meaning behind the word liberal arts. And I prefer to call it liberal arts in, in instead of classical education, because, of course, I the the root verb for for liberal is liber which is the latin word for tree bark which is representative of the free people because the free people could engage in reading and writing which they used tree bark to do that so they were the liber people or the free people or the people at liberty and that's kind of how that grew out of that and so in my mind 
when I say liberal arts, I'm saying the knowledge for freedom, which has a very specific definition for me. To be free, you first need to be a truth seeker, which, you know, you can get a classical education like Mao. And I I would have to say that he had a pretty dang good education. <laughs> but you can... You can be a, a person like him and not be a truth seeker. You can get an education like that and not be a truth seeker. And I've seen it actually over and over and over and over again with the, even in my own students because parents don't get the vision of a liberal arts education in the way that I'm talking about it, the knowledge for freedom. And I've seen what happens to students who get exposed and start thinking, oh, I'm all that and I'm smart and, and all that kind of stuff. And they forget who they really are, which is a child of God, which is on this earth to grow and progress in his boundaries. Yeah. Well, and you talked about appealing to a child's vanity. I mean, we can do that even when we homeschool, right? We can exactly make them. Right. Okay. So that's the key. Don't. Yeah. Try to... <laughs> yeah. And if I had a child. Um, okay. So the book, The Chosen is a um, controversial book. I don't know if you've read it before, but I haven't. So there's two characters, Danny and Ruben, and these two boys meet on the playground, basically. They're in a baseball game, and Ruben gets his glasses broken. It almost ruins his eyesight, and it's Danny's fault. They come from two different uh, Jewish sects. Danny comes from the uh, Orthodox sect, and I think Ruben comes from the conservative sect. And Ruben's father is a great scholar and teacher. And Danny's father, he's a, um, he's a rabbi. And Danny is a super genius, like over the top super genius. Like he is reading Freud on his own when he's 15 years old and he's exploring all kinds of things. And his father can see that this is happening to him. And his father decides to raise him in a specific orthodox way that is a very controversial, but he does it anyway. He raises him in silence. So he never talks to his son. Wow. And you read the, the book and you think, wow, how stupid was that? <laughs> you know, right? And you see Reuben with this beautiful relationship with his father. And his, his father teaches him and he's pliable and he's good. Ruben is so wants what's right so much and and they become really great friends Danny and Ruben and you can see how Danny is growing up super smart super intelligent super confused about his relationship with his father and constantly thinking there's something wrong with him constantly think there's something wrong with him but his father says that he's raising him in silence because he can see that he's too smart for his own britches <laughs> and it's going to ruin him and it's going to take him away from God. So is that, I mean, raising him in silence was basically trying to keep that vanity from being appealed, yes. correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. And so you can see that story really, um, the wisdom of the father purposefully making a choice for that child. And it's so difficult. I will tell you, raising children is one of the hardest things you will ever do yeah. because every single child is different. Going back to my company, Leadership Education Mentoring Institute, we created these thematic units that are married with the, the liberal arts. That's our whole goal, and it's completely unique. I don't know anybody in the world who does it like we do it. So at the same time, purposefully choosing a thematic unit where they're doing writing and reading and all the other kinds of subjects that are involved. Memorizing. Oh, memorizing, yeah. yeah. And history, all of that is all connected together with civics or whatever. We do Shakespeare in a way that I've never seen anybody do it, where they learn Shakespeare in the first semester. We, we do an approach called, it's a language, it's a language approach. It's called the immersion process, where how you learn a new language, where you learn some of the basics of, say, Spanish, and then you go immerse yourself into Mexico. You know, you go to Mexico and you start listening to people speak Spanish and your ear and your mouth becomes accustomed to the sounds and 
then you start learning more of the basics and, and adding more to what you're hearing. It's just an immersion approach. And so because we know that, that Shakespeare is kind of a heightened language, it's a, different, it's a different type of language than what we speak today, that we chose to do the immersion approach. So first of all, we do the immersion approach when we're, when we're teaching them Shakespeare and they do presentations, they learn some elocution, they learn, um, we do lots of writing. And so it, it's kind of what maybe, maybe what someone would call English, the English using that, you know, if, if you were teaching Shakespeare in English, that that would be the, the subject. But the second semester, it's all actors training. And in the first semester, they are doing actors warm-ups every day. So we're merging drama, theater, writing, history, because they do Elizabethan times, history, English, um, memorization, all together into one. Yeah, and so it's a beautiful so process. End, I've, <laughs> I've mentored it, Shakespeare. It just was phenomenal for me. So Yeah, it's a beautiful process, and the children fall in love with Shakespeare like nothing else. They love it at the end of the year they can't imagine their lives without Shakespeare and uh, it was interesting because I had a I went to a conference a, a couple months ago and this man came up to the table and said you know I I'm kind of I kind of like the idea of what you guys do here but um, he says you know I don't like Shakespeare at all I just don't like it and I don't know why you would study it you know I've studied it I've tried to study it. I even took a class from Oliver DeMille studying Shakespeare, and I still couldn't like it. And my son, who's 14 years old, who, of course, done three years of Shakespeare at this point, he looked at him with these big, huge eyes and said, what? You don't like Shakespeare? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, my son, who's this computer geek guy, you know, he doesn't, you wouldn't imagine that he would be this theater or even a Shakespeare kind of person, started teaching him and telling him why he should love Shakespeare. Yeah. Because they fall, because it's meaningful to them, because they have an application for what they've been learning. It's, it just becomes part of who they are, yeah. you know? So we, that's how we started. I actually created that thematic unit, that Shakespeare unit, and, and then merged my stuff with Tiffany's stuff. And we uh, had another project that we were doing called uh, Key of Liberty that we kind of merged with Tiffany's stuff. And we had some leadership stuff that she would be, was doing and we merged all that. So we now we have this, what we call the Lemmy Continuum. We have these several projects that are written specifically for the phases of scholar phase. We call them practice scholar, apprentice scholar, yeah. self-directed scholar. And each phase has a specific kind of right. Uh, their, their project is geared toward that phase, right? Yeah. Well, and the core phase and the level learning phase is pretty easy to apply at home. It is that scholar phase that gets a little more difficult. When ki yeah. And then, like you said, you saw in your children, and I've seen it in mine, they are reaching outside, you know, wanting to be outside in the community somewhere, fitting in, right. you know. And this gives them that opportunity, yeah. yeah. And we just do one day a week. Uh, I believe Louis L'Amour when he said all education is self-education. And so most of their learning needs to be done in their home at their own table, writing, reading. And then you, when you get together in class, you do what, what you do in class, what groups are meant to do. You discuss, you do simulations, you do activities, you know, you, you use the group for what it's meant for. Yeah. Colloquium type. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, as I was saying, we, so th these are what we kind of call core scholar classes, right? But each one of my children have their own genius. And I'm not afraid to say that I, I can see, I can see their genius while all of my children have done Shakespeare, Key of Liberty, what I think are core things, the, the leadership program we call, we call Quest, um, the, the Edison Project, which is their self-directed scholar project, they get to choose what they're going to do and, and they do it under, in a mentoring kind of situation and they have accountability to their peers, but they kind of get to choose the direction they're going to go in, in their own studies. And then we have, a, you know, we have Sword of Freedom and Hero Project that are more of the same thing. We have a Pyramid Project that is math and science kind of base. So all of these are kind of foundational classes that, that all of my children have done. But I'm very careful to make sure that while they get these foundational things, which I think they cannot live their lives without, I really don't want my children to have 
a life without Shakespeare or without knowing the Constitution and their duty as a citizen. And I don't want them to live their life without leadership skills, you know, all of those things. I'm very careful as a mother to watch them grow and to see them gravitate towards certain interests. And uh, I could tell when my son, Brady, was about 12 or 13 years old, he started to, that's right when some of the language uh, programs started to coming out, through the Rosetta Stone. And oh, I yeah. could see him kind of gravitating toward that. And I could see that he really loved airplanes and Air Force stuff. And so we got him to, into, instead of doing scouts, which most Mormons do with their boys, we did Civil Air Patrol, which was really outside of the box. And I got a lot of flack from it. Don't even worry about it. I, I know <laughs> pain. <laughs> um, but he became, he almost got the top rank in Civil Air Patrol. He, he got a, his Billy Mitchell Award, which is his equivalent to the Eagle Award, which is actually harder than an Eagle. They have to do a lot more studying and they have to pass tests. And yeah, and anyway, so I, I got him involved in that direction because I could see that he liked that stuff and I could see that he, he was teaching himself German. So I was thinking, wow, he's kind of liking this. So I was just being the cheerleader. Woo woo, you can do this, you know, on that end and giving him opportunities in those directions that I could see where he was finding his own genius. And uh, when he was called to serve a, an LDS mission, he was called to um, Ukraine and he learned Russian and he came home from his mission and said, mom, what am I going to be when I grow up? <laughs> he also <laughs> loved dancing. And so that was a really big part of his life when he was younger. We had a great mentor here in my community who taught ballroom dance and he just, she was fantastic with him. So what, what was he going to do when he grows up? You know, he's 20, 21 years old. What was he going to do? And I said, well, you know, what do you like? And he says, well, I, I really love Russian. And I said, and, you know, you kind of always loved the Air Force. What do you think? And he's like, okay, yeah, that's what I think I'm going to do. So he, there was another really great mentor in our community who was actually a linguist for the Air Force. So he called him and he said, Jesse, how do I do what you do? <laughs> and Jesse told him everything he had to do step by step by step to get into the language training program and to become a linguist for the Air Force. Wow. And Brady did everything he told him to do. And he scored super high on all the tests, got to choose his own language and chose Chinese. That's interesting. So <laughs> he's a Russian Chinese linguist with lots of dance and lots of, of um, Shakespeare and understands <laughs> he's under, you know, he's memorized the declaration of independence and he knows his, and he's a super citizen. I mean, when, you know, the Air Force loves him because he's this stalwart citizen. He knows who he is in the world of America. Yeah. So we talked about your son. What other testimonials or success have you seen with the Lemmy, with your uh, curriculum and, and the Lemmy Institute? Um, so, I mean, obviously my children are going to be the things that I see the most, but I do have other students in my community that I can say rah, rah to um, a young man right now. And I, you know, as I said, you and I've just had this conversation about appealing to vanities and, and we need to be careful of that. Right. But I have seen, I have a student right now that I just adore. I, I think what he's doing with his life is commendable and pretty much he's just, he's carving his own path. He's got a blog that he's writing his experience as a scholar and you know what? I actually can't remember the name of the blog. I wished I could. Is, uh, is I this Jacob you. Hansen you're talking about? Cause... No, actually, I'm talking oh. about Dallin Shumway. Oh, okay. And his blog is what the, um, uh, something about a philosopher, the... Yes. So, yeah, yeah. I'm trying and to You think. know that. Yeah, because I've actually talked with Dallin. He's been on our show before, so... But uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of what it is. Something the youth philosopher or the... Yeah. Ugh, I'm feeling yeah. bad. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, what I've seen him do is so here's what we do as mothers and we're, and we're so we're so helpful. We can see where, you know, this would be a smart thing for you to do because it's going to be beneficial for you in the end of your life, you know? <laughs> and so 
we're going to see if we can push you or we, we're going to see if you can, we can nudge you into a direction. And I, you know, I'm not saying that his mother has done that, but I think as ge- in general, as mothers, we do that. And, and, and that's what we're supposed to do. But Dallin has, has kind of ignored some of the, the nudges and said, you know what? No, I'm, I'm carving my own path. And this is what my path is going to look like. And I have all the foundational things that you've given me and I can use those things. But right now this is my path and I'm choosing it. Yeah. And he wants to write and he's doing a great job learning, doing more writing. I haven't been able to be as involved as I wanted to with his writing. But Dallin, I, I have a sense, you know, Dallin's headed toward the, I'm going to be a psychologist kind of direction. I have an idea that he's going to make, He's walking down that path. I can see him. He is already kind of a counselor among his friends. People yeah. come to him for advice. He's very wise. He understands life in, in at a level that I don't see most kids doing. But he's he's carving it, you know. And so we'll see when he gets there. Yeah. So he where, was where he's going. Dallin Shumway was episode forty nine, um, self directed scholar. But his blog is called "The Thoughts and Treatises of a Teenage Philosopher." So there you go. There <laughs> I you had go. to find that. It was driving me crazy. So thank you. Yeah. Thank so, you yeah. for finding that. Well, and and we did talk about you know appealing to those vanities. Wouldn't you say that some of the biggest success is just seeing kids like Dallin, like you said. They're not listening to the, the crowd, but they're really thinking for themselves. Yeah. Would you say that's a success in, in your yeah. products? And, and what I'm going to say is most successful in Dallin that I love is he's so well grounded. He, mm, goodness comes out of that boy like none other. You know, you, ju- you just feel his goodness when you're around him. And that's what I want. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Hey Firestarters, are you looking for a new way to listen to The Luminous Mind? Try listening on Stitcher. Haven't heard of Stitcher? Think of it as radio on demand. You can listen to The Luminous Mind anytime, anywhere. There is no downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. Just stream your favorite podcasts such as The Luminous Mind. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and also from your favorite internet browser. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at Stitcher.com or in the App Store. And make sure you rate and review The Luminous Mind so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. Luminous Mind with Anelity Milne with the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute. In our Lemme Scholar Projects, we say what we want is the attitude of becoming versus the attitude of achieving. Yeah. We are growing a child. Well, and we talked about the difference of a well-educated Mao versus a well-educated Washington, you know. Right. Exactly. And if I had to point a finger at what I want all of my, all of the kids who come out of our Lemmy Scholar projects being like, I would, I would point to Dallin because, because of his goodness. Now I'm not going to say that he's the only one. I, I, there's a lot of them. There's, you know, a, a big, huge group of our students are coming out and they are men and women of character. Yeah. Well, a and they are them. also service oriented, right? I mean, where they yes. come out and they say, how can I best serve the world for Yes. You know, with this talent or, or with this knowledge that I have. Yes. There's this really awesome book out. It's called uh, Givers and Takers. Or Givers, yeah, Givers and Takers. Yeah. And the, the whole the whole book is about uh, whether you're a giver, a matcher, or a taker. And it looks like on the surface that takers are better off and do better things and get more in their life. But as they, they've done all the research on the lives of givers and takers and matchers, what they realized is that actually givers are better connected, they're better off, they're happier, they're stronger. And like we would say, Steve Jobs was probably a taker. Steve Wozniak was a giver. 
Hmm. And Steve Jobs' life wasn't always full of roses. But Steve Wozniak, his life, he's been really happy. He's but, done great things. You know, he, he started Apple, Apple Computers. Steve Jobs took all the glory, but Steve Woz- Steve Wozniak, he was the he was the brains behind it all. We know he was, you know, he was, <laughs> he was the nuts and bolts of it, right? Well, and once again, appealing to those vanities. I mean, we will see that in the world that you know we we hold like a person like that up that that is a person who's trying to appeal to the vanities versus somebody who who really is trying to serve other people. So. Right. And and I'm going to say our um, scholar projects, they really are trying to nurture that service in them. You know, the quest, the leadership course that they take at the end of the second semester, they're supposed to do a whole group uh, service project. But every other week, they're also supposed to be doing individual service projects that have to do with the characteristics of a statesman that they're studying. So let's say they're studying virtue. They have to choose a service project that would help them gain more virtue. So, uh, you know, it's, it's leadership course and, it, and hopefully it's doing that. But, but in the end, honestly, Rebecca, it really comes from the home. Yeah. <laughs> that, that character, that goodness that comes from the nurturing in the home. And it also comes from the purposefulness of parenting that's happening in the home. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, you, you can't replace that with a, one of your projects. I mean, those. No, we can't. You know. And we don't try to. We just want. And what we say this all the time is we are just here to support you. What you do in your home is going to be really what they become. We want this to be a support of that. Now, on the other hand, if a parent doesn't understand a project and it's taking a lot of their time and they don't give their children the time they need to do the project, I'm going to say they're not going to get out of the project what they could get out of the project. Parents need to be well-educated and they need to understand what it is that their children are involved in. And we say all the time, one project, it's not like taking subject classes. One project takes 40%, 60% of your time. Yeah. So, well, and so, you are trying to implement other classes. I mean, other. We come from such a segregated education, like we discussed before, that as parents, sometimes it is hard for us to see. Oh, well, they're not getting any math. Uh, they're not getting any writing in. They're not getting <laughs> grammar. You know, some of those types of things. But your projects include all of that, right? So, we, so we have what we call humanities projects, and we have math and science projects. So the math and science projects, yes, include the math. The humanities projects definitely, well, both of them include writing. So I would say if I had a child who was just in humanities project, which would be, let's say, Key of Liberty, my humanities are going to be covered. Everything, writing, really reading, history, elocution, you know, all those things. I would supplement at home with maybe a little bit of spelling and math. Okay. That was the mistake I made with my children is just thinking of it as a class, like a, an American history class and not thinking as a project, you know, like it's going to have all these, it's going to have English already magically built in, not magically, but you know, as it part does of it. magically have it built in. <laughs> Cause <laughs> you haven't disconnected the subjects, correct? Purposefully built in. <laughs> yes. <I'd> purposefully. <laughs> yeah. That sounds much better. So I'm sure there's people in our audience that are wanting to start this, these kind of Lemmy projects. How would you suggest them going about this if they don't have a, like a, some sort of a Commonwealth school? What's the first step? They need well, to you can always start with a mom school, which I think is the best way to start anyway, that you should start just start with come to a training take get the get get what you need from your training go home put together a group and start something there which is we would say is, is a mom school you know everyone i'm an elody i'm teaching this project come to my house and i'll teach it i will say something that's really cool right now is uh all of our lemmy philosophy which teaches about thematic units and learning and the, that the whole holistic approach is actually available on youtube oh that's cool so. Um, in five different segments. So if they wanted to YouTube search at Leadership Education Mentoring Institute or Lemmy Philosophy, they uh, it's probably Lemmy Philosophy. They could watch all five segments of that, and you can actually use that to train your parents. That would be one really good way. Like get, an inexpensive uh, way, maybe? Yeah, because it's free. <laughs> you can just invite people. <laughs> right? 
and hopefully, you know, we're just getting started in this. I, I'm going to, I'm going to be right up front with you right now. We are, we work out of our garage. <laughs> we, you know, first of all, the training that we do is worth $2,000 easily. I've been to trainings and spent that much money and gotten way less than what we give. But because our market won't bear it, because we're working with stay at home moms because they homeschool, right? So they're one income families and people who are putting all their money into education, <laughs> you know, that's the market we're working with. So we have to give it to our audience at a, at a highly discounted price. So we work out of our garage. And if we had more money, I'm, I'm going to tell you, we would have a, a lot more stuff available for training <laughs> and our stuff would probably be much more I'm not going to say we're non-professional but we do still have a lot of editing errors and our videos aren't perfect but I'm hoping that we are able to grow in the next couple of years so that we can fix all those things and that things can become more professional but I'm also hoping at this point people will say hey the content of what I'm getting is worth a thousand dollars and I only pay 350 or 400 dollars to get it so you know we're hoping that people understand that we'll, we'll be understanding that that's kind of where we are at this point we have talked about getting investors we don't know how possible that is right now uh, if we had investors then we would be able to probably um, sink well we would definitely sink a lot of money into more video trainings we are starting a series of video trainings with the first project we've done is the Shakespeare Conquest. And the reason I, I let me back up a little bit and explain why these, why our curriculum has to come with training. First of all, it has to come with training because it's a whole new way of thinking. Project learning is completely different from the subject learning. Second of all, it's the liberal arts, which is not what we get in our, in our world today. And the liberal arts, most people don't have a liberal arts education. So there's a lot of content we have to go over. And then it's the organic process that we're trying to, we're trying to promote. So I do actually have a publication on a Kindle book called the, the Mentor's Handbook. If people are interested in going to get that, they can purchase it. I think it's $3.99. It's fairly inexpensive. It's the five mentor skills that we promote at Lemmy that we try to actually instill in all of our mentors and it takes so much practice and that's another reason why we have training is because they need to practice and then we our training isn't just three days our training is almost a whole year because they get on conference calls throughout the year and they send us mentor reports throughout the year so that we can keep giving them support while they're still in practice in this uh, project that they're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, that was a disclaimer. We're not, we're, you know, <laughs> we're not, perfect. we would like to be more professional. So you, you watch the videos and you're going to say, Oh, the lighting is not exactly perfect on that. And Oh, that you're just going to have to say, uh, we're, we're doing the very best we can. Most of our people are volunteers, you know, and those who, who've done the editing for our videos have done it for, you know, pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Well, and I'll add my kind of my testimonial in. I mean, my children, I did some public school stuff with them when they were wanting, you know, they wanted to have some community outside of our home. And when I finally was able to get in touch with, um, you know, I put my my kids have done uh, Shakespeare and Key of Liberty and um, Sword oh, awesome. of Freedom and all of that. It's definitely a different way of learning. And I do believe that you do need to go get trained because it was a it is a definitely a paradigm changer from what what we as public school parents, you know, trying to homeschool now have to experience. And and I think that we are the ones holding our kids back. They want something yeah. better. We just have because to reach for it. It's so interesting because my daughter, Natalia, just went to a, um, she's, she's 30, my daughter's 30, what, 31 years old. And she was the one who helped me write Shakespeare, Con the Shakespeare Conquest back when she was 17 years old. But she has been teaching Pyramid Project and we just trained her to become a trainer for Pyramid Project. And so she was back in Virginia doing a training 
with this wonderful, amazing group of people. And she called me in the middle of the training. She says, Mom, I'm having a hard time casting vision. These people want to understand what, how this is different, why it's so cool. And I said, you know what your problem is, Natalia? This is the way you were raised. Yeah, she could. She can. You don't know anything different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but us, like I said, our parent or me, you know, because I'm a, I'm from the public school. It's such a different way of thinking that I just think that you've got to be trained to wrap your <laughs> head all the way around to what you're trying to to implement here. So, yeah, that's great. So, so yeah. what kind of legacy do you hope to leave with this? First of all, I do have to say, I, I already feel a legacy. We are le leaving a legacy. I will tell you an experience I had in Washington. I went to a training in Washington, and it was amazing. This woman, Genevieve, she put together this training for several projects that we did, and she did a fantastic job. And the people there, I, I work with the finest people on the planet, well, I was teaching Key of Liberty, and um, so I was I was training that. And my we I went to go pick up one of my co-trainers was at an was at a different location, and so I had to take the car and go pick her up. And I just walked into the room. Nobody really knew who I was that wasn't taking the training. There were a couple of people there who didn't you know was they weren't kind of involved in the whole thing. And there was a young lady there. And they had out, she, my, my co-trainer was, she was doing Shakespeare Conquest and, and uh, one of the people, one of the Commonwealth schools had a representative there who had brought their, what is it called? Uh, sh scrapbook. There's their Shakespeare scrapbook, the book that they put together with all the pictures of their play that they had done this past year. And I was flipping through the scrapbook and I was so excited. I was looking at all the pictures and I was thinking, oh my God, this is so beautiful. I love this so much. I was just joy coming out of my, you know, of my body. And this woman came to me, she, she introduced, she was just going, she says, oh, this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so. And she didn't really know who I was. And she said, oh, and this is my son right here. And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. And he said, she said, you know, this boy teaches Shakespeare classes. He was, a, he was the Shakespeare youth uh, assistant for, for two years. And now for in summer, in the summertime, he teaches Shakespeare workshops for kids who are not homeschoolers and oh, who want wow. to learn Shakespeare. And he is 17 years old. And, he's, and she said, and that's how he's raising money so he can serve a mission for the LDS church. Wow. That's pretty and I amazing. Said, I said, I can die. <laughs> <laughs> My life has been meaningful. I did something good. You yeah, know? second generation. So that's pretty amazing. And he's teaching kids that aren't homeschoolers. Yeah, creating and, that spark in places yeah. you know that that they <laughs> that isn't there normally. So. Right, and changing the culture. He's he is changing the culture. I I did one thing. I trained a trainer. I trained a mentor who who mentored him, and now he's going out into his community and he's changing the culture among his own peers. That is wonderful. It's it's going to be such a beautiful thing, yeah. and people are going to grow up loving Shakespeare instead of hating Shakespeare. <laughs> and why do I care about that? First of all, I care because Shakespeare is one of the greatest poets who ever lived. Well, and so much and, of our world comes from Shakespeare that we don't even realize. Yeah, he he added like, I can't remember, I want to say 20,000 words to the English language, I, something like that, something yeah. enormous. I mean, we, we use, you know, like isn't, it's an elision that Shakespeare created. Don't won't you know all those words are Shakespeare words so I mean it's it, it is true truly an English legacy legacy but mostly he's a he's a great poet and he understood human nature like no one else I know and he showed it to us yeah he reveals to us what happens in a tragic life he reveals to us what can be funny about the things we do in our lives yeah, exactly. So before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice or maybe a favorite quote that you'd like to share? And then please give us your contact information so our audience can get in touch with you. 
parting words of advice. Yes. I'm going to have to say the most important thing I ever learned was you, not them. And I know that sounds really drastic. And I know that sounds really scary. You know, as Oliver DeMille says, it's pulling the pendulum over to one side because the pendulum stuck to the other side. We're focused, so focused on them. We forget about us. And if we get our own education, that's when our children will really benefit from what we can give them. That is so true. I'm going to say you, not them, you, not them, you, not them. And as soon as you get that, it can become you and them. And that's what is the beautiful thing when it becomes you and them. Well, I think when it becomes you and them, they appreciate that education even more because they see you, you know, you're the, you're the mentor for them, um, really enjoying it, and they want to grasp it for themselves. Yeah. So, And my children would say that they saw me grow right along with them. Yes. And they saw me studying right along with them, and they saw me changing right along with them. And that makes them feel like life is possible. It's doable. You know, they have a lot of respect for me. Yeah. Even when you start at 27, it's possible, right? (laughs) Yeah, it is. Yeah. So that's my parting words of advice. And if you want, if you feel like the best way for you to start is through a Lemmy training, then, then you should start there. Uh, Lemmy training is a great way to start at getting a scholar phase yourself if you don't have a scholar phase. But if you don't, if you feel like you need a core phase or a loving love of learning phase, start there. That's the place you need to be. My contact information is you can actually just email me, Anelady, A-N-E-L-A-D-E-E at yahoo.com. Our website, uh, there are a couple websites you can visit that I'm, I'm part of, and that is thelemmytraining.com. And also, if uh, one of these days, I would really like to have a conversation about what I do with life-changing services. But also that website, if you're interested in that, is... Um, Eternal Warriors Training dot org. Okay. Eternal Warriors. Okay. I will be sure to hook all those up on the show notes and so that okay. our uh, listeners can find you. So and like right. I said, I I was so excited when when I met you and I went to your training and I was even that more excited that you were able to accept and come on our show. So thank you for taking so much time with us today. This has no, been wonderful. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for everything you're doing. You're changing the world. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Anelity Mill and the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 